Yes, we can. Great. Okay, that's okay. successfully done. So welcome everyone. And thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you to um, Chloe and Elise and Nicole and all the alumni team for the invitation to offer this event. Um, uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to speak with, um, speak with university alums. And what I'm going to do today is touch on some aspects of Aberdeen's medieval town records, which have in recent years being made digitally accessible. And one theme I'll focus on is how these sources open up a window onto thousands of personal names of individual people who had cause to be recorded for one reason or another. And the way these uh, records present um, some opportunities for those who might be interested in particular in the history of names or, or naming practices, or indeed even of family history in the Middle Ages. But I'm also going to offer some context uh, for um, the nature of the project that's been underway uh, to investigate um, these records and uh, touch on uh, an element of one of the exciting um, creative responses to this academic project, which has emerged in uh, recent years. Now, I'll just come back in to my slides. And I wanted to um, focus um, especially on the, uh, the what, what are known as Aberdeen's borough records. And borough is a term which may be um, familiar to many, but uh, not perhaps to all as a, a Scots term for a town with certain privileges of self-government. Um, and this term in the Scottish Kingdom is something which is in evidence, certainly from the 12th century onwards. And royal boroughs like Aberdeen were those ones which held a special grant of privileges from the crown, which made the king the superior lord of the town. And the uh, borough itself was as an agency of, of local government responsible for maintenance of, of life in, in the urban space um, that held these privileges. Uh, one of their responsibilities was the um, uh, production and uh, maintenance of, of certain records of government. And so hence the borough records. What are they? Well, they are a collection of handwritten books that are called the council registers. And these are bound volumes. Uh, the images, uh, well, the image on screen is of the earliest eight volumes which survive. And they are um, volumes of paper records. Um, they are records of uh, town government, which in the time of their creation, um, surviving from 1398 onwards, were known as the, as the common books of the borough. And they um, encompass a range of different types of aspects of, of governance. So they could include uh, details of the election of local officials, the admissions of new burgesses um, to, the, to the burgess guild of the um, community, the uh, leasing of land that was owned by the borough collectively, such as uh, property um, Holdings, but also in particular fisheries uh, along um, the, the Dee and the Don, collection of taxes, uh, official letters, uh, which um, could involve communication with authorities externally, like the king or with other uh, towns and uh, bodies um, internationally as well, local legislation, ordinances uh, regulating um, the behavior of people, you know, for instance, in terms of where. Um, certain uh, activities could take place, uh, such as uh, the slaughtering of animals. Um, but uh, predominantly, Aberdeen's borough records are mostly the records of various courts that were held within the jurisdiction of the borough. And they, uh, as a focus of activity, these courts regulated uh, trade, but they also regulated um, aspects of social behavior. And these um, have uh, 
significant in um, a number of ways. On screen is the mention of the UNESCO UK Memory of the World recognition that Aberdeen's borough records have held since 2013. And that's a recognition for um, their continuity and depth um, in terms of uh, you know, Scottish urban records from this period. More survives for Aberdeen from before 1500 than survives for all other Scottish towns combined. So there's a, a tremendous um, set of um, historically important records here and have rightly been acknowledged for um, for that significance with the UNESCO designation. So here's a map of Aberdeen in um, the 17th century. And um, it is, although um, from a couple centuries later than the main focus of the uh, first eight surviving uh, volumes of the council registers, which are the UNESCO designated ones, um, this is um, helpful in that, you know, between the 15th century and the, and the 17th century, not a significant amount changed in terms of the layout of the borough itself. Um, in the 15th century, Scotland um, had four principal towns of which Aberdeen was one, recognized as such by no less than, than Bruges. Um, but we're thinking in the 15th century of a town with a population of about 4,000 inhabitants. Um, so relatively small scale, and um, it's important to note as well that this, this map zooms us in on Aberdeen situated on the D. This was the royal borough, which um, contained the, the, the site of the uh, old castle, which had been demolished in the Wars of Independence. Um, it includes the site of the parish church of St. Nicholas, the site of the harbour, um, of the market, and uh, the, the toll booth, the sort of townhouse building. Um, which is our principal focus uh, of attention. And this is the this is the borough that the records we're speaking of uh, inform us about. But of course, just to the north, there was also Old Aberdeen, which was the um, settlement around the uh, Cathedral of St. Backer and focused especially on the Don, which uh, of course becomes home to the university from 1495 onwards. But it's important to keep in mind that what we're looking at here is especially the um, uh, Aberdeen on the D. And uh, I mentioned the borough records, um, and I think it's important to note not just, you know, the, the eight UNESCO designated volumes, uh, which I've mentioned, but there are uh, rich seams of collections that the city archives cares for, not least uh, a series of charters which date from the 1100s, um, from uh, principally from the crown, giving privileges to the, to the um, civic community, but also on screen is the 1317 roll, which is the only preserved uh, record of the sort of content from the borough records, um, uh, from the council registers uh, from before 1398. And this dates from 1317. Um, it is uh, now uh, in the uh, volume eight of the Stair Society of Miscellany. Um, I've with my colleague Andrew Simpson have uh, published a uh, English translation of the Latin text of this uh, court roll and um, it was preserved in the end of the 16th century as an example of the earlier material which at that time the town clerk in the 1590s said was in very poor condition not least because much of it was being preserved uh, not in the townhouse but in the crypts in St. Nicholas Kirk. And you can imagine the uh, sort of deterioration that might have um, uh, been, been reaped on, on these records. So we're very lucky to have one example of this uh, surviving uh, at all, and um, uh, tremendously lucky to have the council register volumes, uh, which begin from 1398 onwards um, in our collection. Here is a page from, uh, one of the council, uh, two pages from one of the uh, council register volumes. Um, there are um, some obvious uh, challenges in terms of working with this material that this image makes clear, not least in terms of the quality of the survival, in terms of the um, ability of being able to, to read this material in terms of its state of preservation. Uh, some pages much clearer, clearer than others. 
Um, but even if you can handle the, uh, even if you, you are fortunate to be uh, working with a page that's well preserved, uh, you still have the challenge of the handwriting uh, and being able to read that handwriting for which the skill uh, and discipline is known as paleography and the languages contained within. Um, the languages are um, uh, Latin and Middle Scots. Um, that is, there's a tiny little bit of Dutch. Um, but uh, these are the two languages which appear in these records. We'll see more on that in a minute. Uh, what else could be said here is an uh, example of a Latin court heading, uh, which just zooms in on a little bit of detail of uh, what one of these um, entries might, might look like. And this is setting out the beginning of the record of a Bailey court. OK, so that's an overview of the borough records themselves. And I wanted to move on to the, to the story of the, uh, the project. Um, and on screen uh, is a uh, URL at the bottom, aberdeenregisters.org, uh, which uh, has existed um, since 2016. That's a, a, a one-stop uh, set of um, uh, blogs, links to other aspects of the project that you can go to find information uh, and keep up to date with how we've been progressing. Uh, but the, it is uh, since 2012, since the Aberdeen Borough Records project um, began, uh, and it is principally a collaboration between Town and Gown. So this is about um, working uh, with the city archives um, and uh, a, a link between the city archives and the, the university for investigation of this material. Um, and that's been a really fruitful link um, and it's one which is, um, continues to thrive. Um, but that uh, began in 2012. 2016 uh, was an important year within the project because we'd moved on from some pilot stages to a grant from principally funded by the Leverhulme Trust but it, with additional funding from Aberdeen uh, City Council and the Research Institute of Irish and Scottish Studies, which enabled a digital transcription to be produced of the council, the text of the council register volumes that we've just been looking at. Um, and we'll say a bit more about that in a minute. 2019 led uh, to uh, further stages, um, not least the release of the uh, Aberdeen registers online, which is that digital text which I uh, refer to, um, but also the fruition of a number of um, publications uh, to accompany that uh, digital edition as well, not least a volume which I co-edited uh, with my colleague Etta Frankot on cultures of law in urban northern Europe. Um, 2021 was a year which led on to um, a really exciting project uh, to uh, create uh, and release a, a video game uh, called Strange Sickness, which we'll hear more in a moment. And 2023, where we are now, is a year which brings to uh, conclusion a collaborative project, which has been um, working with University of Mainz and with colleagues in Germany at Mainz who um, have focused their work on the civic records of Augsburg, which is the image that's on screen with this slide. Um, and the medieval, principally financial records of Augsburg from the later Middle Ages. So we put that in dialogue with the principally legal records of Aberdeen for a project. The acronym is FLAG, uh, Finance Law in the Language of Government to Aberdeen and Augsburg in comparison. So that project has been underway since 2020 and is coming to fruition now. Um, I want to move to a map image which um, sets out um, the way in which these records, and I think this is, this is alluded to in terms of the potential comparison with Augsburg, although Augsburg isn't mentioned in, in the Aberdeen records and vice versa, Aberdeen not in Augsburg. Um, but the point that this map makes clear is that these records aren't just about Aberdeen. They're records that tell us about Scotland and they tell us about Europe. Um, and here we have on this map uh, ports, which are those ones that are most frequently mentioned in the course of the 15th century records um, and gives you a sense of some of the main points of contact with Northern Europe that um, Aberdeen maintained. Um, and of these, the uh, ports at Bruges and Fira 
which at different times were the staple ports for Scottish trade with the continent, um, are by far the most prominent um, in terms of the, the volume of mentions. Um, so these are, this is a visual display of some of the ways in which these records help us place Scotland in its European context. Um, but there are other uh, elements to keep in mind as well. And touching on the theme of names, which I alluded to at the outset, is um, the, uh, na names which identify people from different places as well. So here we have some names uh, which are indicative of uh, John of Lubeck, uh, John uh, from Ghent, Andrew of Bruges, on Andres of Bruges, uh, Nicholas or Klaus, Dutchman, uh, which may refer to somebody uh, from the Low Countries, but uh, Dutchman is also potentially identifying somebody simply as a, um, a Deutsch speaker, so potentially somebody from uh, from uh, German-speaking lands and not uh, not specifically the the Low Countries. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, some specific mentions of someone like Otto uh, Drosers, whose ship comes from uh, Trailson, so Stralsund uh, here. Um, so the way in which not just um, particular records, uh, entries in the records might mention other towns, but even personal names can capture this sort of European context in which um, the uh, world of late medieval Aberdeen was, was actively engaged. Now here's an image of an open volume. And um, the mention I made a moment ago was to the new digital edition of the earliest eight volumes from 1398 to 1511, which um, appeared in 2019. And this is called the Aberdeen Registers Online, or the ARO. And that was um, a, one of the, the principal output from the project which ran from 2016 to 19. And that was one which involved manual transcription of the text from images which had previously been created by the city archives with the National Records of Scotland of the 2000, uh, sorry, 5,239 pages within um, the eight volumes. And um, this was what we uh, undertook, um, a transcription of the uh, contents of these pages. And here's an example of you know, zooming in on a particular passage and then uh, giving an example of a middle Scots um, transcription from the, of, the, of the text. So our uh, team working on this required a specific set of skills in paleography to be able to work uh, with this script. But it was also uh, a purpose of this project to produce something that was going to be machine readable. And uh, so this is what's known as XML, which is the, um, uh, the file type that we produced for um, the formatting of the uh, material itself. This is, you know, not not just within a, a text file or a, you know Microsoft Word document, but within uh, an XML format that allows this material to be read by uh, computers and displayed um, for analysis or for um, uh, browsing and searching in um, a standardized way. And uh, this is a the principal output of that um, ARO is, is a set of XML files, a set of digital files, which um, we've released as open access sources to anyone in the world to be able to um, make use of. And they can be accessed and downloaded from this uh, link uh, here. And we recognize, though, that this was you know, going to be helpful for those who might have um, the, uh, the tools and um, capacity to be able to work with uh, XML material, and it has that tremendous flexibility um, for, for that sort of investigation. But we also saw that there was going to be a need and an important um, need to be able to present the text that our project had produced in a way that was uh, searchable and accessible. And so the creation originally through a student, a series of student-led projects working with computing science students in Aberdeen, um, created what uh, is now Search Aberdeen Registers, the SAR, with the URL on the bottom of the screen, which lets you browse and search through the text of this digital edition uh, and display it alongside the corresponding page image. 
Um, now, the digital edition itself is something that um, has uh, encompassed um, one and a half million words. That's our best estimate of the scope of the, uh, the word count for the uh, for the ARO itself. So it's a huge amount of material and a huge volume of information, which tells us about, um, not just, as I say, not just about Aberdeen, but about um, so many aspects of life in medieval Scotland and Northern Europe. Um, there are some uh, limitations though, to what we have produced in this digital edition. For instance, um, it doesn't allow us to capture some of the details in relation to the watermarks which appear on the pages. Um, and here's a good example of a watermark um, or the bindings um, within the volumes themselves. These are material aspects which you know, are required you know, for, for future projects and future investigation. Um, but we have uh, been able to uh, identify, at least with annotation, um, some of the elements within the, uh, within the material that um, you know, with notes where we, we might identify, for instance, there's a pointing hand, a manicula, um, or that there are baker's marks that are included um, within the, uh, as visual content within the records themselves. Now, I mentioned the one and a half million words, um, but we touched on language briefly a moment ago. Um, there is a shift um, across the period of the 15th century in terms of the language content of these records. So that in the early part of the 15th century, they are predominantly in Latin. And that's the uh, orange part of the pie chart on the left hand side of this slide. And on the right hand uh, shows a, a sample from um, much later in the 15th century. Uh, the left one was was actually mid-century, still showing us a huge amount of Latin, but by um, the circa 1490, uh, we have a much smaller proportion of orange, a much greater proportion of blue, and, and blue representing the Scots language content. So there is a language uh, shift which happens across the 15th century, which uh, partly uh, is um, a function of a general increase in the volume of material and the expansion of a documentary and a, and a literate culture in uh, 15th century Scotland. Um, and that expansion in terms of page content and the size of the volumes that survive from the um, later part of the 15th century is indicated uh, in the table that's on screen here where we can see in volumes one and two from the beginning of the century, we've only got a small, you know, a few hundred pages each, but by the uh, volume seven, six, seven, and eight, we're, we're at sort of a thousand or well over a thousand pages per, uh, per volume. And you can get a sense of the kinds of chronological coverage of those pages over time. So there's an expansion of volume of material across the 15th century, but that's also reflected in an increasing use of the vernacular language. Okay, um, I wanted to touch next on an example of one of the entries from the 15th century. This one is from 14, sorry, this is from 1500. And this um, records the appearance in Aberdeen of a ship from what's um, identified here as Danskin or uh, Danzig Gdansk, uh, as we know it today. And the issue that the town council has to face with the arrival of the ship is the problem that people getting off the ship are obviously ill with plague. Um, and, and this is plague is in the, the Black Death, which, although it struck first um, Europe in the mid 14th century, keeps recurring over, over time. And this is in the context of a further outbreak of, of plague. And the town now has to take measures to deal with the arrival of um, a ship from overseas, bringing infected people into the borough itself. And the steps that are taken here are actually um, social isolation, where the, um, those who are ill are um, to be quarantined within a particular house and there to stay until uh, at least 15 days or until they're without symptoms. Um, so this touches on one of the themes that is prominent within these records, which is, um, which is public health 
and uh, the way town government uh, took measures to um, protect the town from the threat of, uh, of illness, such as through plague. And this uh, formed the basis of the theme that was developed um, in 2020 and 2021 around one of uh, the creative projects that's emerged from the borough records, which is the video game Strange Sickness. And so this was uh, a game which was um, led by my colleague, William Hepburn, who's a research fellow, uh, both on the Lacquer project um, and in the flag project, which I mentioned. Um, but one of his uh, aspects of interest around this material has been its potential for, for games development. Um, in 2020, we worked together to come up with a um, uh, steps to, to generate um, uh, a Kickstarter campaign, a crowdfunding campaign to uh, raise support for um, the development of this game. And uh, the alumni team were absolutely integral in spreading the word about, about that. And it was a real pleasure to be able to have uh, success from that Kickstarter campaign in 2020, um, where we raised over 6,000 pounds from um, 220 backers. Plus, we then had uh, the university come in on top of that to match funding. Um, and additional support um, uh, from, from uh, further backers as well, um, uh, in, including from the Aberdeenshire Council Archaeology Service as well, which, which came in as a supporter. And uh, in 2021, we developed the game. We worked with uh, colleagues who you'll see images of in a moment, um, Catherine Neal, uh, who's a professional game developer, and uh, Alana Bell, who's an artist, graduate of Gray School of Art, um, and the four of us together collaborated to create uh, the game. And here's an image of the uh, map from within the game where your job as a town councillor is to convince the council that threat of plague is real and that steps need to be taken uh, to protect the town. And you move around from location to location, you interact with characters such as those in the, uh, the uh, barber surgeon's uh, shop, um, the Medicinar and others uh, to find out the best ways to protect the town and then to convince the council of um, the need to take steps. So there are um, uh, these elements within the game, but also uh, draw attention to the game's uh, supporting website, which is at strangesickness.com, which also includes a historian's commentary. So although the game is very much about exploring the theme of uh, plague and public health within um, the, um, within the game world itself, there's a number of um, points that we wanted to be able to support players to investigate more and find out more about the records um, through a, a website which we constructed as a, as a commentary by, uh, by William and myself as the historians um, contextualizing the game. And it's something which has won some really fabulous recognitions, not least the um, uh, nomination for the Scottish Games Awards 2022 uh, creativity category, but also for the um, BAFTA Scotland Awards 2022. Uh, we were one of three nominees for um, best game. Uh, didn't win, but we uh, were absolutely delighted to have that nomination. And here uh, we are celebrating at the BAFTA Awards. Um, now, okay, so that is something uh, that we could come back to possibly in the discussion, but I wanted to um, say a little bit more about names, because um, that's something that I uh, alluded to from the outset. And um, here is an example, which draws our attention to uh, the information that the ARO offers about thousands of people. Um, Plenty of people are mentioned in this one and a half million words in the context of everyday business of town administration. And um, here's an example uh, of an entry which um, has a bit of Latin and a bit of Scots. And it's mentioning um, a few different people here, but one of my favorite names within the records, Rumbold of, of Handwerp or Antwerp. Um, and he's mentioned here in um, the context of uh, Derek Merlin of Slouse, and um, we've also got uh, a Burgess of Edinburgh, Allard uh, Isabranson 
um, we've got Lawrence, Wist, um, and so forth. So we have a number of um, folks that are mentioned in the context here. Um, and so a nice indication of some of the, the clear links that these records have um, with the low countries. Um, and, you know, in terms of taking some of the personal names from the records, um, there are some challenges for us in terms of interpretation of them, and not least in terms of the diversity of name forms that occur. So, for instance, diversity of four names um, and variants of surnames that occur both in Latin and in Scots. Um, there's a tendency in the record for uh, names to be um, in the form of a Latin forename and then a Scots vernacular surname, but there um, are often variations around that which can uh, pose some uh, challenges for identifying, particularly, you know, do, do multiple references to names that look the same actually identify the same person? There's a real challenge there of interpretation uh, when you're working with this material. Um, there is uh, a ref uh, screen here which um, zooms in in particular on name surname forms which are indicative of a Gaelic language origin. And all I've done here is to look for uh, Mac and Mick uh, variants in the records to uh, try and uh, establish what kinds of names uh, might take, um, uh, what sort of Gaelic vernacular surnames might appear within the records themselves, um, usually with a Latin forename. Um, so it's not just uh, Scots, there's also indication here of other linguistic um, uh, elements within uh, personal names in the records. And um, having you know drawn attention to this, this is a relatively small amount of uh, names within the records. What I'd point out here is um, the much more uh, typical um, linguistic form of names, which is taken from those uh, surnames, of people who registered as, as Burgesses from the 15th century through to 1631. And this is a list drawn up um, at the end of the 19th century um, where these names were uh, listed in order of frequency. Um, so you can see, actually, there isn't much of a, of a Gaelic um, language origin with these names, but much more of a, of, of a Lowland Scots origin, um, which is you know, probably no surprise at all in terms of thinking about um, how boroughs uh, fit into to the wider linguistic um, and cultural pattern within uh, Lowland Scotland. Um, but that's a further uh, point that we could discuss in questions if people were interested. Um, I wanted to draw here example of another entry, which points out um, the uh, dimension of gender, in particular, uh, women's names. Now, there are um, a huge number of names um, of women which appear within the ARO. Uh, and this uh, slide gives us the example of Ellen Scott, uh, who's identified here as Ellen Scott, the wife of Henry Bonn. Um, now, it's not always the case that women are identified by their own personal names. Often they are identified solely by their family relationship, especially to their husband. So by contrast to Ellen, we've got um, uh, James Burvey uh, or his wife. We, know, we don't get an indication of, of the, the given name of uh, James Burvey's wife. Um, so, you know, there, this is this sort of variation that can happen, uh, particularly with women's names. Um, it's also um, notable here, and we can see it with the Ellen Scott example, of women in uh, late medieval Scotland using their birth surnames after marriage. And that's entirely typical in this period and, and uh, many parts of Scotland through um, to the 20th century, um, the idea that, um, that a birth name would be something that would be maintained and used yeah, after marriage. Uh, now, a craft or trade that was dominated by women uh, was that of brewing.
And uh, the image here gives us um, a listing of Brewsters in the borough. Uh, these are identifying these women only as the wife of, and then the husband's name. So here's a list of Brewsters uh, who are um, being enumerated for a particular administrative purpose, um, but we are you know, getting no indication at all of their, uh, what we would think of as their, their forename, their first name. It's just simply the wife of um, uh, the husband. So there is some evidence of family relationships that we can see through names, um, but these family relationships can be challenging to um, have some firm confidence about. Um, and uh, even to have confidence about multiple mentions of a similar name actually referring to the same person. When you're up the social scale and you're dealing with elite burgesses and certainly landowners, um, there's a decent prospect of being able to um, have some consistency here because higher up the social scale you go, there's a greater frequency of stable surname usage in this period. But uh, you know, further down the social scale, uh, state surname usage remained in flux and whether a name referred to someone's personal characteristics or family relations, um, their uh, place of um, uh, residence uh, or their occupation, these, these were all possibilities and they, they could um, coexist as well. So there's um, some difficulty in terms of trying to fix names and, and assume that, that one mention on one occasion refers to um, a similar looking entry for another. Um, so the best way into this is to look for contextual evidence. Uh, for instance, sometimes you get parents mentioned, so admissions of Burgesses might um, mention the name of the, the parent, the father, who's a uh, Burgess. So this might help us with trying to identify contextualizing a, um, uh, an entry and being able to identify the um, family relations around a particular name. And finally, um, and then we can get to some questions, um, are some really fun nicknames which can be found as well. Uh, from 1401, we've got um, Margaret Valdi Polkra. Uh, Margaret Valdi, or you know, is this, is, is this Bonnie Meg? Polkra means beautiful in Latin. Um, and so this is, um, uh, appears to be used as part of a Latin name, um, but seems to be uh, mentioned here as as a two name, as a, as a nickname. And um, early 15th century as well, we've got a, a example of a Latin name which has a vernacular nickname inserted in the middle. We've got John, um, who's a tanner from Deer, but he's just identified as John out with the sword um, as, a, as a nickname. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some um, uh, exciting examples uh, like these, which tell us about the usage of nicknames in relation to naming practices. And that's where I'm going to stop. I just want to say thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to any questions or comments um, that you might have. I see there's a few that have been popping in. Um, so I will turn over now to Nicole and Elise uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm in your hands in terms of pointing me to questions. Hello. Yes, that was amazing. Thanks so much for the talk. I really, 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 really enjoyed it. It was really great to get to see some of the, uh, I didn't have to get my magnifying glass out to see all of the, all of the names because you very kindly made it bigger for us. Um, so I have a question which ties in with Eleanor's question. Um, she asks, what um, languages were the records written in? And then you'd mentioned you know, the three different languages, but I wanted to know why, why Dutch? Middle Scots makes sense, Latin makes sense, but I find it odd that like out of all the, you know, countries um, in Europe that they had connections with, there was Dutch. Great question. Well, I, I when I had that map of the different towns which are mentioned, um, the staple ports of Bruges and Fira in the Low Countries is, um, I think, a clue to that. That's a, um, a primary focus for for Scots trade with the with the continent, um, and there's close uh, linguistic similarity between um, aspects of Dutch and and, and Middle Scots. Um, one of the uh, examples, the one uh, of two which mentions Dutch, is actually the record of a um, a contract 
which was made by um, Burgess, uh, by, by the um, provost of Aberdeen, John Vos. This is in the 1440s uh, with um, a Dutch merchant. And this was made um, outside of uh, Antwerp. And the, it was a loan of money. And the, uh, the Dutch uh, merchant was to repay the provost of Aberdeen this money. Um, and this contract was written in, in um, Dutch within the Aberdeen material. But what's interesting is also you've, you've got the terms for that repayment, which is that it was to be paid to the children of the provost who were at school in Paris at the time. So it gives it, you know, even that little snippet there gives a sense of some of the international connections that were apparent for the um, certainly for the elite within within the borough. But uh, Dutch was, uh, yeah, the Low Countries were a principal trading partner. Um, and so that emphasis is is important within the records. That's very cool to know. I didn't realize how close our connections were. Um, David has a question. Do the records throw any light on the Aberdeen Mint? I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing money? I presume that's that's what um, is being referred to. Um, so the short answer is not that I've seen. They have plenty of information about um, money and um, coins. Um, so uh, you know, by all means, hop on the SAR and search Aberdeen registers and, and um, search for terms relating to coinage and, and money. Um, but they they don't, as far as I've seen, give us any indication of. Um, uh, coin production within Aberdeen in this period. Thank you. Um, and then A. Hartley asks, with the shift of Latin to Scots as the language of volumes, did the Refor Reformation in the following centuries impact the rate of the shift? Or do you think the shift was already complete before the Reformation slash would have happened regardless? Interesting. Yes. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're long before the Reformation with these records. Um, the Reformation does have a um, impact in terms of the um, uh, the place of uh, of the vernacular within everyday worship. Um, but one thing is is it's certainly clear from the, the example of the Aberdeen material, but with other Scottish records of the 15th century is. Um, the expansion of, of uh, writing generally as part of the tool of um, administration and uh, practice of, um, you know, uh, the way people engage with courts. Um, they were bringing documents to court. They were keeping documents. They were taking extracts of, of records um, and doing that um, increasingly in, in the vernacular in, in Scots. Um, so I think it's something which is which is well underway in the later Middle Ages, and, and the Reformation um, is something that, that probably um, serves to accelerate um, that that further. But as we can see it clearly underway at the um, end of the Middle Ages. Um, I mean, one other note for those um, interested in Aberdeen generally is, um, which will be known to many as is, but probably not enough is. John Barber, who was Archdeacon of Aberdeen at the end of the 1300s, but he wrote the epic poem, The Bruce, which is about 80,000 words, and that's uh, the first uh, sustained work of poetry in Scots, um, and you know, he's, he's known as sort of the father of, 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 of Scots uh, literature in that regard. Um, and that's a, that's a clear um, step towards the vernacular in, in the very early part of the period that we're looking at. That's really interesting to see how early on the vernacular was getting into the mainstream uh, written work. Um, there is a question about the video game, wanting to know what age is it aimed at and has it had any, you know, work with schools or any relationship with schools um, so far? Great question. Um, we've not worked expressly with schools. Um, there's there's been certainly been interest from schools and certain teachers uh, within schools, and that's something which is a possibility for for the future. I think one of the things that was um, important in in making the game was we we wanted to make the game as a game. We wanted it to be um, you know designed as a, um, a a game that would be fun to play. It's a it's a a narrative game, um, a little bit like a choose your own adventure storybook 
Um, but we, we didn't design it to be a, uh, something that was necessarily a teaching tool. We wanted that to be um, more sort of passive within, within the game itself. And to make explicit though, you know, the ways that um, uh, you know, games can, can work with historical records. Um, so that's something which uh, you know, might be there for the future, uh, but that wasn't a principal consideration for us in making the game. Um, age range, my children were amongst our play testers for the game. Uh, and they were, at the time, they were six and 12. And um, the six-year-old super enthusiastically engaged with it visually. Um, but uh, in terms of being able to, to engage with the story and the narrative, um, certainly the reading is, you know, it was the 12-year-old who I think would probably be right at the cusp of um, you know, meaning really substantial engagement with the, with the story. So at 12, 13, you know, S1 um, would probably be the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, earliest age, I would say. Great question though, thank you. Yeah, thank you for answering. So we have another question here. Um, drawing from the records, would it be fair to say that surname stability was heavily dependent on land property slash um, land slash property ownership. Also, is there anything that undergraduates could do to aid with the project or any related projects? Okay, so great. Um, so the first one, yes, uh, definitely stability of surnames is something that for the nobility is closely associated with property ownership. And, and that's something that you, know, you, you can see in place from long before the 15th century. Um, but uh, what these records let us do is see, you know, the way names are being used uh, at different rungs within the social hierarchy. Um, so the higher up you go, definitely more stability, and the further down you go, much more fluidity as a rule of thumb. The um, question about uh, yeah, student engagement with the project, always welcome. There's a number of uh, more formal ways that um, students have engaged through my third year course I teach. One of the Assessments is a group project where students uh, team up and um, use the Search Aberdeen Registers tool to investigate different aspects of the records. Not the, and a good example is to, to try and identify multiple mentions of the same person. All the difficulties I mentioned in this talk, but try to um, map out the sorts of career uh, structure that there might be for people who served in, in town government um, or look for um, uh, particular themes in in the records, you know, for instance, entries in relation to, um, uh, well, in, in relation to um, uh, what one example that comes to mind is is finding um, the women who are related to the men who typically served as town officers, with a view to trying to build up a bigger prosopographical picture. Um, so there's some formal projects, but I'm always open to um, working with with volunteers, um, so do get in touch directly um, if that's something that you're you're interested in. Ooh, very exciting! We could have some good collaboration off of this. Um, Dr. Keith commented, "Interesting. If you were on a canal in Holland, how would you ask um, how deep the canal is? Um, simply how H O E space deep D I E P is easily recognizable." recognizable is how um is how deepest um so very cool little language thing there sandra has a question um why did aberdeen um come to such prominence as opposed to other east coast town cities such as abroth arbroth and edinburgh um well i mean aberdeen was was prominent um, amongst the leading um, towns of of the of the kingdom um edinburgh uh, Dundee, Perth, and Aberdeen are the four that in the 1300s are recognized by Bruges as the four leading towns of, of Scotland. Um, uh, Arbroath is uh, in Edinburgh, of course, you know, by the end of the 15th century really comes to be established as the place where the king stays most. Um, and that uh, by the 16th century is a place we can think of as a capital. Um, but a uh, place like Arbroath is one which you know has a really significant religious house um, and an urban settlement around it. Um, you know, not unlike 
St. Andrews, for instance. Um, but all these towns are along a kind of uh, emphasis uh, in being on the eastern seaboard of the kingdom and oriented towards um, the, the North Sea and, the, and communicating in that wider North Sea littoral. Um, so Aberdeen certainly isn't, um, you know, most prominent um, and it's still pretty small scale, but it's one, um, you know, it, it fits well within a kind of network of, of towns along the eastern seaboard of, of the country. Thank you. Um, we have another, a few other questions. Um, do the records sure. provide much insight on the relationship between Aberdeen and Scottish royal authority? If so, its status as a royal borough make for more general, harmonious, or tense relations? Mm. Yeah, I mean, one, one example in relation to this, which I've been focused on for, for part of today, um, is the expectations that the crown might um, set for a borough like Aberdeen in terms of its contribution for military service, um, and you know whether that's a financial contribution or to provide um, uh, fighting forces. Um, uh, you know that that's that's one aspect of the dynamic between um, you know town and crown that you know could sometimes. Uh, create tension. We, we're missing what's known as Volume Three, which covers the period from 1414 to 1434. But there are a few um, extracts from that volume that were copied out in the 1700s, um, which do survive, and they tell us about 1429 when James I was undertaking a campaign against um, the Lord of the Isles um, and the request for um, military support from Aberdeen, which isn't forthcoming, and then the town is fined um, as a result of uh, of that sort of failure to to comply. So, you know, this is one theme in which there can be can be um, you know uh, potential tension. Um, but overall, the the town very much sees itself as uh, you know closely uh, linked to and 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 bolstered by royal authority. So it's not seeking. Um, usually to, 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 to push against that. Um, what gets interesting in the, the 1490s is where you get certain um, members of the uh, civic elite, John Rutherford being one of them, who uh, is particularly close to the crown and who starts to uh, manipulate that relationship uh, for his own uh, p position. Um, so, you know, the, the way in which that relationship with the crown can be you know, taken advantage of by individuals is something which you can also see in the records as well. I'll stop there. Um, we, we have quite, we have a little while longer for questions. So if everyone wants to send them in now so we can um, fire through them. Um, could organizations such as NTS utilize the translating software mentioned today to look more closely at record books they take care of? For example, Crathy's Castle 16th century um, Bar Barony, Barney Court room book. Okay, interesting. So two elements there. Uh, one is a sort of um, technical question and then there's the um, question of other types of records. So. There's there isn't a translating tool here. Uh, we did we did uh, a, a transcription, which was copying out the exact text as it as it appears, um, and and representing that in in um, you know com computer readable um, characters um, through the principles of of transcription and paleography, and that was a manual project. There is a um, project which is um, called READ, R-E-A-D, which has a tool called Transcribus, which is working on automatic um, text recognition of handwritten text. Um, and it's been underway for a number of years um, and is improving always, but is um, still has um, some further steps to go to, to, to become um, uh, as efficient as you might want it to be um, for, for a project on, on this sort of scale. Um, so that's just a note of um, context around the, the, the technical side. So it wasn't about 
translation, it was about transcription, you still need the, the tools uh, to be able to work with the, uh, the languages in the record, um, even if you know, the ARO has, has at least tackled the transcription challenge. Um, but there are um, so many records that are, you know, cognate with the material from Aberdeen. Um, some of the, the landed families in the region that you mentioned, so Crathies is the Burnett's of Lees, um, and actually the Burnett of Lees papers uh, are um, preserved with it now within the collections at the University of Aberdeen. Um, so although the Barony Court Book of Lees from the 17th century, I believe, is um, still on site at, at Crathies, um, the charter collection of um, that family is is within the university and is a potential area for future investigation. Drum, uh, the Irvings of Drum, another NTS property, which has a charter collection, which is on site at Drum. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of potential there in terms of uh, engaging this material with the records of the local nobility, which, you know, who were, who were closely invested in uh, the life of the borough. Um, the Irving of Drum is, is uh, the captain of the borough for a short time in the 1440s, um, and uh, it doesn't last long. They, 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 they kick him out of that role, but he remains closely linked um, in his effigy um, with his wife from the mid-15th century is now within the um, St. Nicholas Church. Some may have seen it. Um, however, um, the project, which um, is, you know, keep your eyes out and on the Aberdeen Register site, because in thinking of cognate record collections, there's actually the university's own collections, which also tell us about Aberdeen and in particular the records of Marshall College. Um, prior to its foundation, um, the site of Marshall was the Carmelite Friary. And um, those papers from the Middle Ages, the Carmelite property charters, would tell us about people in Aberdeen, especially in the 1300s and 1400s. Um, they're part of the university collections. And um, with um, uh, Yulia Valius, who's now a PhD student at the University of Glasgow, but was formerly uh, an undergraduate at Aberdeen. Her, her undergraduate dissertation was looking at the witness lists in those Marshall charters, those Carmelite deeds. And so we're um, just about to release a, a working list of witnesses from that collection. And that's the kind of thing that I think, you know, could be an interesting model for working with other cognate collections um, that tell us about the Aberdeen in the Northeast in the future. So great question. Um, always open to ideas like that. Thank you. Great. So next question is, are there any mentions of interactions with the university or an old Aberdeen? Or what do the records essentially look like for the, I think you said four separate areas of Aberdeen? That's right. So Aberdeen is divided, in what we think of as the Royal Borough is divided into four quarters. Um, and that those are administrative units which each have their own officers elected. Um, and uh, usually that's the way that um, steps are taken to um, uh, organize um, the regulation of uh, sometimes of crafts or certain activities. Um, the old Aberdeen as a separate settlement um, is mentioned um, and increasingly from the time of the um, 1490s onwards, uh, not least because uh, in the context of the establishment of the university, uh, there's also the establishment of a, of a borough of barony, uh, which is owned by the bishop, Elphinstone, in, <clears throat> in that period. So there, uh, we do get mentions of the bishop, probably a lot fewer than you might imagine. Um, and we do get um, mentions of some of the um, uh, academics who were involved at the uh, university in its early days, not least um, the overlap between the first mediciner um, of the borough, who's appointed in 1497, I believe, and um, whose name escapes me at the moment, but he's also becomes the first um, um, professor of medicine uh, at the University of Aberdeen uh, at about the same time. So there's a, a nice duality there um, in, in the records. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, do the records make any mention of Highland slash um, Romney travelers? And this ties in with a question that I had written down is, do the records show anything of migration at, um, with the names? 
Okay, really good question. Um, in terms of travelers, um, the, uh, I mean, there might be um, possible uh, insight there, but it, certainly nothing that's that struck me um, in the past, um, but, you know, relevant terms you might search for within at the SAR and see what, see what um, occurs. The uh, highlands are um, also relatively um, uh, they, they, they're not the primary focus of, of, of these records. It's, it is predominantly the, the, the urban network of East Coast, uh, Lowland Scotland in terms of other place names that are mentioned. But um, you know there's a there's a project that somebody could do, which is you know investigating the place names within Scotland that are mentioned within the the records themselves and mapping those out. That would be fascinating. Um, but I think what you get is a is a is a map of of that sort of urban network in the along the eastern seaboard. Um, migration, good one. Um, you get uh, it's very difficult to try and assess. Uh, anything that we might think of as a sort of permanent settlement um, and migration, but certainly people moving moving through the port there as um, you know, you know traders, merchants, um, or having come on on a, on a ship from from abroad, uh, with some of the names that I that I mentioned in in one of the earlier slides. There's um, a real indication of, of sort of uh, dynamic movement around the North Sea littoral that that's suggested through these through these records. But moving from there into um, the ideas of, of sort of individual permanent settlement would be would be harder to to, to try and plot out. Um, they don't the, the governing authorities don't try and tax um, foreigners. As, at the same time, the English government is trying to tax foreigners in the from the 1440s with the alien subsidies so it can fund the war in France, um, which is going badly. Um, and uh, that becomes a regular pattern of, of revenue generation, but the Scottish government doesn't do this. Um, so, you know, it just depends on on, on, uh, on what governments try and, try and do in terms of the generation of records. But um, yeah, I hope that helps with, with the migration question. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. So I see we have two more questions here and then we'll okay. round off. Um, so do we have any clues as to when the missing volumes from the records were lost or are there any other missing records that we have? Um, so other missing records, we know that the material before 1398 existed. Um, and uh, but we know that one of the changes in 1398 um, was from those long rolls that I mentioned with that 1317 roll, uh, which is on parchment, to uh, paper records um, bound in um, in books or laterally coming to be bound together in books. Um, and that uh, shift in technology uh, from from parchment to paper and keeping things as books it seems important in terms of that um, record preservation. And, and part of the reason why um, the material might have been preserved um, better than the earlier material. So there is lot, there's plenty of lost material, um, and, and all we've really got to go on is this 1317 rule. Um, but we last know the uh, the material covering 1414 to 34, that volume, what's known as volume three, uh, existed circa 1800 because uh, it's um, uh, mentioned in uh, some inventories at the time, uh, but then it uh, it goes astray at that stage. And the um, in the 1980s, the then city archivist um, and then the deputy keeper of records of Scotland um, had a, a formal um, um, search for any evidence that could be found of these records, either in Aberdeen or indeed within uh, the national records of Scotland, because the, the one of the urban myths is that the um, the records had been sent to Edinburgh previously and you know had had never been returned, um, which is a story that is repeated in different boroughs um, around the, the the country. It doesn't seem to have any substance, um, and it seems to to probably have been something that um, was lost because. The records left the townhouse and went into someone's private hands um, and, and were not returned circa 1800, which is a great shame, um, but uh, they may yet turn up. That's a, that's a continued mystery 
Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could find the missing volume three at some stage? Yes, everyone check in your um, old cupboards. Um, <laughs> if you're from Aberdeen and see what you can find. Um, last question, well. <laughs> I know. Last question that we have here is, do the records provide any indication as how important kin relations were for urban laborers and tradesmen in Aberdeen of this time? Oh, interesting. So kinship and um, for the lower rungs of society. So thinking about laborers and, 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 and craftsmen in the context of 15th century um, life. And uh, what would be the best way into that? Um, possibly through some of the um, contextualization of particular name forms that appear. So for instance, focusing in on, on patronymic name forms. Uh, would be an interesting way into that that question. Um, you know, is there a sense of sort of genuine uh, usage of a, of a patronymic name like um, Anderson? Does that mean that someone's father is actually called Andrew? Um, you need some contextual information to try and um, and identify that. Um, one of our undergraduate students um, this year has undertaken a, a project which is uh, looking at a question related to this, um, but. Uh, otherwise, I think you'd be um, uh, you, you'd, you'd be relying probably on uh, finding individual entries which go into to some rich contextual detail about a sequence of events, um, possibly around disputed um, property or um, or goods, which might show us sort of family relations being called on um, uh, in the course of a uh, uh, you know pursuing someone's claim. Uh, in in a legal context, and those are um, uh, those I think would be the, the the best ways into that sort of question. Um, but there isn't a sort of um, a, a quick answer to that one. But it's a fascinating problem. You know, we've gotten a few comments of just everyone saying thank you so much. Um, so yes, thank you. thank you very very much for coming and giving such a wonderful and insightful talk and answering oh, everyone's nice. questions. Um, so yeah, everyone, that is the end of the talk and end of the discussion. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed and um, I will see you guys all for the second wave of um, online talks that Chloe comes up with next. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Elise and Nicole for, for chairing and thank you everyone for listening and for your questions. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon or good evening now.